Five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. Welcome to The Advocate, or should I be saying, welcome back to myself, as we kick off a series of heartfelt discussions on the issues that matter to all of us. I'll be saying it as directly as I can. Labels are quite dangerous, and I hope to point out just how much during my advocacy. Wallaha says it in the words of the elders, with a wisdom that transcends time. He says, a word is enough for the wise. David waxes eloquent on this, his second outing, and says pro-African does not necessarily mean pan-Africanist. Some might struggle to see the difference. Chuka is certainly in no-holds-barred mood. He gives voice to the cries of George Floyd in a touching advocacy that also sounds a note of warning. Ekene takes us on the road to 2023 and beyond. She is highlighting what she calls the consensus of common interest as the way forward. Well, the consensus here is that it is time to press forward after the break. A warning label is usually an indication to tread carefully. What happens when the label is itself the source of danger? Today I'll be talking about the dangers of labeling. Labeling has become an integral part of our lives. It is something we're all guilty of. Labeling helps us comprehend the complexities we come across in humans and everything around us. Our labeling is based on social, economic, or political construct. It serves to put people into neat boxes so that we can either support or discredit them. However, I think it has gone a little too far and it is time to rein ourselves in. Labels are quite dangerous as they hold a lot of meaning and are often related to judgments. They create stereotypes, a stigma, bias and often stem from hearsay. Unfortunately, we live in a society that encourages herd mentality and this is what really makes labeling dangerous. Most people don't seem to have the ability for critical thinking. They're unable to separate the person from the label. Labels, especially where people are concerned, serve to lump diverse groups of people together, discarding any individual identity. It therefore fails to account for the context of situations, allowing for blind judgments on individuals or groups, which only serves to discredit their life journey. This is the catalyst for discrimination or hate culture, as we gradually dehumanize people and reduce them to just labels such as racists, white supremacists, bigots, fascists, and so on. The bias created by labeling affects a person's reaction, which is usually negative. Labels not only create expectations that are either high or low, but also fail to look at the whole picture. As a result, it causes harm to the individuals attached to the specific labels and creates mental health stress as people try to live up to these labels or expectations. It is very common for people to begin to internalize their labels as well. Words are powerful. When we engage in labeling, we should note that it says as much about us, the labeler, as it does about the labeled. 
Our words and tone of voice all come together as an indication of how we perceive others and see the world around us. Our self-image is strongly tied to the words and labels we use. We must therefore start to realize that we are not our labels. We're so much more and we don't belong in a neat box. We are complex, diverse and beautiful in our own right and labeling, labeling ignores these facts. So today, I advocate that we remember that labels are just that, labels. From topics of race, gender, socioeconomic status, mental health, religion, physical health, and everything in between, we would have less issues of stigma and discrimination if we dropped the labels and gained more perspective on our actions and our words. We humans are not goods on shop shelves that require labels. We need to allow ourselves and others to be free to be who we truly are. Okay, should I go straight in? I hope Walaho and uh, Chuka are there. Um, I just wanted to say that, yes, I mean, overall, I get where you're coming from, but I wanted to just preempt that by saying labels are in themselves not wrong. I don't think you're saying that no, they no, are. No, I'm not saying Obviously, that. they're open to abuse. Yes. Um, and because obviously, if we didn't have labels, we wouldn't be able to categorize. So I know you're a woman, for example. You know, I know he's a man. It just, it helps identify where you're coming from mm. and it helps have a conversation around them. So my problem is maybe, you know, when you're talking, I was writing down stereotypes, you know, which is what it sounds like goes on. Yes, and I remember absolutely. someone recently saying to me that on social media in particular, they have polarized, more polarized discussions these days. It's almost as though people are coming from a place of fear, maybe because they feel the knowledge is too vast for them to ever conquer it. So it's ra you rather just attach a label and have done with it. So you throw a stone at someone, you know, and yeah. if it sticks, so, you know, <laughs> so rather than getting to know you because it just seems like too big, too big, a, you know, it's too much work for me. Yeah. I'll just say, okay, you know, David is a, a whatever, a, a woman hater, yeah, you know, and, you know, Uche is this, and then that way we just deal with ourselves from opposite sides exactly. of the fence. Yes. So from that perspective, I really do sympathize, mm -hmm. and I feel, I, I, I sympathize with people who feel overwhelmed with all the information coming at them, which is why I shut down, but I feel that's no excuse to now begin to become hateful towards yes. other human beings. Yes. I think we really, especially with what's going on now with the George Floyd, we must make a concerted effort to keep that channel open to getting to know people really. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't know them, don't rush to attach a label to them. Don't, don't do, especially herd mentality, don't do that. It, to me, it's just, it's, it's a lazy way out. Don't join other people to box people. Mm -hmm. Take your time. If you don't know, keep quiet. Mm -hmm. That's what I'd advocate for. Mm. It's, it's funny you mentioned uh, the label, uh, labeling me a man and her a woman mm. uh, as useful ways of categorizing people. Because a few days ago, there was, a, there was a conversation on Twitter. I'm a heavy Twitter user, so <laughs> I, have, you know, I tend to keep track of what's you happening. You labeled around yourself the world. now. <laughs> heavy and Twitter user. There was a conversation happening around a, a writer called J.K. Rowling, the lady mm -hmm. that wrote mm -hmm. Harry, yeah. Harry Potter. Mm -hmm. And for a while, she has had this, uh, this point of view that she has been quite vocal about that there needs to be a conversation around what exactly being a woman is in the context of transgender identity. Oh, okay. Right, yes, okay. yes, that yes, somebody, yes. she spoke up about yeah. transgenderism and okay. that somebody doesn't, just, uh, mm. somebody doesn't just transition mm -hmm. into a woman mm. and then assume everything that a woman is because right. there's an actual history in that identity of being a woman and mm. there's an actual differentiation. Yes. Like being a woman actually means something. It's not just something you can dip in and out of. That's yeah. That was what her point of view was. However, before I actually got to read what she said, I had to wade through a ton of people <laughs> saying, stones at her. saying what they thought she said. Mm. So, and a term I came across very often was something called TERF, T-E-R-F, mm -hmm. which basically means trans exclusionary radical feminist. Wow. Oh, wow. You didn't know so, that. I didn't know that. So it's a thing. It's yes, a term, no, right? And that was thrown at her a lot. Oh, JK, I can't believe J.K. Rowling is a TERF. Oh, my God. My childhood is ruined. You know, mm -hmm. the person that wrote Harry Potter is a TERF, blah, 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 blah. And then people started saying, um, well, did you notice that the Harry Potter had so few black characters? Maybe, oh, maybe she's so a racist. She's racist oh, okay. You know? Yeah. And I just thought, this is, like, this is the kind of conversations, this is what we do these days. In the year 2020, this is how we have public discourse. We, just throwing names at people, labels at we people. We stay in our little communities and just throw sticks and stones mm. at people. And we don't actually, we talk at each other. Mm. We don't talk to each other. Yes. So nobody's 
uh, there's no cross pollination. Nobody's mind is actually getting enriched. Mm -hmm. People are just angry at each other. Mm -hmm. You see, I don't mean to be mean to people in general, but I think that social media has made a democratic and level playing field of something that isn't actually a level playing field. Some people are too stupid, and that's what it is. And when they're allowed to speak, that's they illegal. will say nothing that makes any sense. Um, I mean, why would Harry Potter have black characters when the setting of Harry Potter is itself before the time when blacks were absorbed into Europe or England? You know what I mean? I mean, even when I was in school in 1980, there was no need to rush black people into programs because they really were not even that much in the society. So Harry Potter is absolutely well, uh, what do you call it? Well, um, it's correct for its time. And um, I think that a lot of people now are just too silly to be offering their views. Mm -hmm. And this category thing is terrible. I mean, for some of us, we just blank that whole thing out. Like I blank out certain things. And um, so when I say you're either a man or a woman, if you feel like telling me that something in between, I'll blank you out. I, I, I look at it from the point of uh, view of how dangerous labeling could be. If you remember the Rwanda genocide very well, when a, a tribe referred to the other as cockroaches. Mm. And that was taken across every person that was of that other tribe. And when you see those cockroaches, you're supposed to treat them in this particular way. And a lot of lives were lost because of living. When you come home here, every at a point in time, I think that must have been 2017, do you know that every headsman become, became a kidnapper? Meanwhile, we've also had headers in, in the South for over 300 years. And all of a sudden, whenever there is a kidnap, it is blamed on headers. That is labeling. Every kidnapper could not be a headsman. So we see it all around us, whether it is in the religious level, whether it's a, it's a professional level, they are all, all over the whole place. But, but let me, and, let and, me and ask, it's something that is very dangerous in society. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, Bolaho, just to throw in, but is there no place for labeling, even though people are being irresponsible about it? So for example, in the instance of George Floyd, you know, a lot of people wanted to argue that it wasn't racism, but it was useful to identify that it was, for me it was, Let's identify what's going on here so we can know how to deal with it. There's no point deceiving yourself and saying, no, it's, uh, he, you know, he snapped in a moment of whatever. If, he, if there's something, uh, uh, what's the word, Institution, institutional about the way they've been dealing with black people and it's happened serially and it's manifesting in, in showing those traits, should we not give it a label so we know what we're dealing with? I understand what you're saying. You can label it. Once we can break down the attributes, that constitute a particular character, then we can put a label on that character. Yes. But when you go into labeling the way which you have presented it, people don't even go into all those attributes. They yeah. just they just look on the surface and the label. They hear a sentence and the label. They see a race or a color and the label. And that is where the problem is. Okay, well, my advocacy certainly comes with a caution, just as Bolaho's advocacy warns us to beware the man that promises to buy you a garment. Find out why after the break. When a man promises to buy you a garment, the words of elders are indeed words of wisdom. Is it not amazing how proven that a centuries old can effectively explain and instruct on matters of today? The Yoruba say, when a man promises to buy you a garment, look first at the one he is wearing. As simple as it appears, it explains significantly why our choices of leadership have continued to fill us. And it could also offer a basic guide into how we choose leaders in the future. When a man has been governor, and after eight years, the state he governed has 80% poverty rate. He wants to be president. And he says, I will eradicate poverty, and I will lift out of poverty. How? Tell us. In the little Nigeria he has been given to govern, he could not make a dent on poverty, and he thinks that the solution to a failed student should be promotion. When a man has exercised power over a domain for years, 
And that domain was poorly educated before him. And after all his power and influence, the domain remains an enclave of illiterate. And he says, give me your mandate and we shall transform education. It is a lie. It won't happen. If every day my kids and kin are being kidnapped or killed where I come from, and I come to you and say, I will provide you security, tell him to go and start from his base. If the hospital in his own year doesn't work, or he says it will make your own work, think about it. It is a mockery and a pipe dream. If a man ran a state or exercised great powers on it for, say, eight years, and by the time he left, the state was still as much a beggar for money from Abuja as he met it. When he came, IGR was only 15% of the state revenue. When he left, IGR was still 15% of the state revenue. And he comes and promises us diversification of the economy. It's just a story. It won't happen. We can go on and on. But like they say, the world is enough for the wise. There is 2023 ahead. I hope this proverb will guide our choices. A governor who cannot unite the state cannot unite a much more complex nation. I want to advocate that we judge every governor and other key political office holders who may desire to lead this nation in 2023 by the state of the state they govern and the public offices they led. If he cannot run a state into prosperity, it will run the nation into poverty. Thank you, Bolaho, for that. Because um, I have to say, I think that was really my reaction when I heard that um, Atiku's daughter said that he would run again in 2023. And I looked at her and I just thought, you know what? <laughs> I've been bitten enough with these old guys. We, we don't see any difference. We don't see anything going on. And I, I fell for it last time, but there is no way. I fell for that, you know, I didn't look at the garments. I just said, let me just buy. But I'm not falling for that again. I think I actually said <laughs> to my mom that even if a goat <laughs> puts its name up, I would rather vote for that. I'd rather vote for the unknown mm. than to vote for what I already know. Yeah. Um, what am I going to put my faith in all these old timers that have come, they've been in power for however long, you know, and then we're supposed to believe that they're going to do something, they're not going to do something. And I really think, finally, Ekene, I have to say that your courage last time, though we're all laughing at you, <laughs> saying you wanted to vote for the Morgalus and the Durotoyes and whatever, um, I actually now think, yes, I might just You're join you. Yeah, chance. I'm willing to take that chance I mean, because, I mean, look at what we've had, what we have, so <laughs> yeah. why not? Why are you laughing? But let me let me make a point for you. Tell me why you're <laughs> laughing. Because I, 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 I look at it and I'm still trying to understand the psychology. What is it that made us stop caring about the garment? Because I know when people talk about in the olden days, if you were a red a red calfed chief, you merited it. I, you know, I'm, I'm a real advocate for meritocracy, whether in the home, in your classrooms. Mm -hmm. I feel once that breaks down, once you stop caring about who is qualified, everything breaks down. Mm -hmm. And then it even breaks down the incentive to compete mm -hmm. in, in, in an honest way. And it take, once you take away that incentive, everybody is now open to corruption. So what is, what is it that made us stop mm -hmm. caring? And, and I still have to bring it back to money, where you somehow are looking at, you know, it's all like emperor's new clothes. Someone tells you that this is the man and you all fall behind him. Maybe again, herd mentality. Mm -hmm. You know, something is fundamentally wrong with us, where we don't care enough about who merits the job. And we're more interested in buying the lie because by now we know it's a lie that mm. just because he's from your state doesn't mean he's going to do anything for exactly. you so why do we want to keep swallowing that lie time and time again my brother my brother doesn't do anything for me you know so why am i not looking for the man who will do something for me irrespective of where he comes exactly. from what is wrong what is wrong with our mindsets i really want to get at the heart of this problem Maybe yes david might so, tell us <laughs> i'm going to get into that in a second but mm. i just want to quickly engage with something that uchen mentioned mm. um for the avoidance of doubt um when you're trying to avoid what has already failed in the past mm -hmm. in the context of Nigeria, we should, we should try and uh, frame it correctly that this isn't necessarily just about those old people. Okay. They're also young people who have failed. Well, that's true. Yeah. So yes. it's about the person's but record. But she's talking about the known failures. Yeah. As it's about the person's record, known. not the person's <laughs> age. And that's yeah. important because yes, what yes. I've noticed... Oh, no, I didn't mean it about... I, I hope nobody this thought isn't I was a, talking about age. <laughs> this isn't a I critique of you. I was talking about you. the record. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not a critique of you, mm. but it's something that's important to mention mm. because of recent, we started noticing 
a number of people under 50, under 40 in politics mm -hmm. or in public service in Nigeria who are, who are trying to trade on their age as a political achievement. Okay. <laughs> that I'm in office and I'm 43, so mm. that's an achievement. Mm -hmm. Vote for me because I'm young. No, it's about the record, not mm -hmm. the age. No, absolutely. You can be worse than the old guys. Yes. The second thing I wanted to mention was... still looking for enough of the young people. Let me see them. <laughs> Let me first see them. Then we know what you're saying. Let's but have the choice. <laughs> yeah, carry on. The second thing I was going to mention was with regards to what Ekene said about how the concept of meritocracy in public service or wherever has broken down. With respect to public service in Nigeria specifically, I think that it has turned into a sort of theater for people. People don't really see political leadership in Nigeria as something that interacts with them, yeah. with their lives okay. on a granular level. So you see, let me use <laughs> let me use where I come from as an example. So some guy who maybe was a, a local council chairman or whatever, or he was in the House of Reps representing this area. And we know him, but he doesn't, he comes maybe once or twice a year, he doesn't even live there. He's very distant, spends all his time in Abuja or wherever. Mm -hmm. And at the end of his term, somehow there's this expectation that, okay, he's supposed to move up to the next level. So now he becomes a senator. What is that based on? I don't know. Do we, do we feel like he has had any impact on our lives? Not really. But like you're saying, we don't but feel we can even influence that whole process. It's not even just that we don't feel like we can influence it. It's just like there's an expectation. Like It's almost like a civil service thing. Oh, yeah, it's like you were on, you were on level on. eight, now you move to level mm. nine. And, and there's, no, there's no explanation why. If you were a rep and you want to become a senator, why? It's yeah. just expected yeah. Yeah. that yeah, but, that's what should happen. But where do we you come know? in? That's still that's you're, the point. That you are a governor, that so you want to become a president. Yeah. Mm. Why? Nobody yeah. ever like nobody thinks about that mm. why. So because if you think about yeah. the why, that's when you're going to need to start thinking about the person's we're record. We're going to need to bring Chuka in on this. Sorry, because yeah, I, I think, don't have much yeah, time. Yeah, I, I, I well, think basically my answer to David is that um, they've separated politics and governing. And so they get promoted in, 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 in politics, but we outside are not the ones promoting them. They're doing it completely regardless of what we feel. Mm. And that's because they are doing it regardless of what we feel, because they are elected regardless of what we voted for. So we need for. to make, make so, them regard us. Yes, and that's it. Together. We are not part of the scheme. Yeah. We're not part of the scheme for promotion. That's basically what it is. Mm. Oh, we need to make our numbers count. Yes, polls. we do. We do. Um, well, what, what I, you see, is, is absurd. When you look at the political scene and, and the people, various people that are showing interest in running this nation, if you were a, a governor, for example, for eight years and your state is filled up with out of, out of school children and Marjorie everywhere, and then the next thing is you said you want to be president. I don't understand how that, how that, how that should be. And it is all over. It's not just about, you know, states where there are majorities. There are also people in the South where if you can't point at what they have achieved in the previous public office they held, they never led. They made money, all right. And it's, it's just about the money to throw around and they want to lead us again. We must be conscious of these things and ensure that the pedigree of the people seeking to lead us, not pedigree in terms of the degree of what they have done yeah. to count that's when where, we're making That's where choices. the media have to step in mm. and hold them to, to account. To account. Yeah. Bola Ho and I seem to be on the same page as concerns the need to judge a proposal by its precedent. However, whereas it speaks of it in a largely Nigerian context, I will be turning my attention to Africa after the break. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.
An appearance of a collective can sometimes be the very cover for a raping and plundering of the same. My advocacy today is called Yes to Africa, No to Pan-Africanism. Several months ago, I wrote a newspaper column which undressed the personality cult around a certain East African strongman. I think we all know who that is. Now, the acolytes and admirers of the fellow in question immediately went into character assassination overdrive with death threats, harassment, phone calls to everyone around me, you name it. What was my crime? According to the gospel of Pan-Africanism, I had crossed the African picket line to criticize a respected African leader. And for this heinous crime, I was to be canceled. Which brings us to problem number one. The optics of Pan-Africanism are awful. What the angry birds in my mentions did not realize was that I was once one of them. Just six years ago, I would never have written an article criticizing someone perceived as one of Africa's leading lights. What changed, however, between then and now was the experience of actually living in Africa as a full-grown man, as against interacting with a fictionalized, romanticized notion of the continent from the safety of Europe or North America, as I once did. In this time, I learned two important things about Pan-Africanism. I learned that first, in its signaling hotep form, it is cringeworthy, insincere, and agonizingly ignorant. But more importantly, I learned that the Nkrumah version of Pan-Africanism simply doesn't work. It is a romantic, emotional idea driven primarily by feelings as against realities. There is about half a century of evidence showing us that Pan-Africanism only ends up being a cover for dictatorships, economic vandalism, illiterate leadership, and encroachment on social and political freedoms by an ever-expanding and incompetent state. This brings us to problem number two. Pan-Africanism is anti-intellectual and insincere. The recent conversation around the death of former Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi is a case in point. To many, Gaddafi is the Pan-Africanist champion who boldly excoriated the white imperialists and had plans to turn Africa into a continental superpower. In reality, Gaddafi was a brutal dictator who had a series of disgusting personal habits and appetites, including kidnapping and raping teenage girls. His grandiose Pan-Africanist rhetoric generally never went beyond the talking phase, as his plans were impractical and unrealistic. The economically illiterate gold-backed currency, the United States of Africa, these things never had any real chance of happening, but they were precisely the type of hot air that Pan-Africanists love so much, which is why his 42-year dictatorship is now held up by, by Pan-Africanists as an example. Now, problem number three. Can the Pan-Africanist cat catch mice? Former Chinese Prime Minister Deng Xiaoping once famously remarked, it doesn't matter whether a cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. He made these comments before China opened up and launched an economic phenomenon in the early 90s. Unlike Deng, modern Pan-Africanists are not as bothered about achieving positive economic and geopolitical results as they are about doing these things a certain way. The revolutionary Marxist language, the assumption of absolute victimhood, I have no use for these things. My vision of an economically integrated Africa comes without the baggage of Nkrumah's Soviet-inspired Pan-Africanism, which has repeatedly failed for over 50 years. As I have said elsewhere, Asia, with its many geopolitical conflicts, enjoys high levels of trade integration. This has happened without Pan-Asianism, which is proof that Africa does not, in fact, need to share a single conceptual vision for trade and development to take place. Just build the roads, rails, ports, and airports, create unified trade policies conducive to economic growth, and allow the democratic systems we have to do their job. It's really not rocket science. Let me, let me throw my, my two Kobo war theme there. Um, I'm not sure I agree. The reason I don't is because I would call myself a Pan-Africanist, simply because, especially in this day and age, and what I hear about the way the, do you say, the first world powers are banding together to reset the economic agenda. Yeah. I wish we had a Pan-Africanist movement. When I look at what's happening with um, Akimumi Adeshina, I wish we had a Pan-Africanist movement that would get behind him. When I look at how people are, you know, I heard recently someone who deals in cocoa said that he was frustrated from exporting his cocoa because it's, it's, it's tipped against Africa mm -hmm. deliberately in such a way that you're forced to import the, export your raw materials at a lower price and import their finished products. So the scales are tipped against you because you're the underdog. 
And I feel that numbers are in our favor. And then I spoke to a friend of mine in Ghana who deals a lot in these things. And he said, if only Nigeria and Ghana would get together, that we have enough population to both sell and buy amongst ourselves, that you don't need to always be at the mercy of people like you know, the first world countries. And then I'm up, so when I looked up, when you were talking, I said, let me look up the definition of Pan-Africanist. And it says, you know, people of African descent have, it basically says that it's when people of African descent have in, believe they have a common interest and they should be united. That's the definition I found. So I'm not sure, I, you know, Nkrumah may have had his way of seeing it a Soviet, but I don't know how many people followed, bought into that. Yeah. So my own argument would be a bit similar to what you said when you last came. Don't throw the baby out with the uh, bathwater. Just because democracy, <laughs> just because, the, I'll just say this and I'll leave the floor. Just because democracy seems to have failed doesn't mean democracy is faulty. So just because Pan-Africanism seems to have been abused by people like Gaddafi, I didn't even know he was even someone worthy of recognizing, mm. doesn't mean that you can't still have re, you know, respect, responsible leaders in Africa come together and share enough of a common vision to give us the weight we need in, on the global stage. Mm. I've finished. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, do, I do like what you've said, Ekene. I also understand where David is coming from, but just so that, you know, we can balance the skills as well. Um, I was looking at some, you know, like what happened with Madagascar when they produced their COVID-19 herbal, uh, drug, herbal drink. drug drink. And, you know, because it came from Africa, the WHO and, you know, all the Western, they, they, I mean, the WHO, let's even focus on them because let me not bring anybody else in there. They felt they could dismiss it and not give it as much credit. And they even said, oh, you know, we haven't tested it. Basically, if they haven't tested it, they haven't, uh, you know, put it through trials, then sorry, it's not something that they would advocate for. And and so they put all our herbal drinks and all our whatever remedies, they put it to the back burner, basically where, where we're supposed to wait for the answer to come from the West. Now, I think if we were... Pan-Africanists. Pan yeah, Pan-Africanists, <laughs> yes. Then we wouldn't need to wait for the West to come in and validate everything that we do. We would move as, as a force and, and we would just get our things done without you know, necessarily waiting for the West to say, well, here, have the go-ahead, blah, blah, blah. We have um, all the herbal medicines and everything. We could have just come up with our own solution by ourselves instead of waiting because... Africa has a different set of problems to the West, and yet we're constantly waiting for leadership to come from the West. Why do we do that? Why can't we come have our own homegrown solutions and work that way? But I also understand that, like you said, if, if individual economies just get on and sort out the economies themselves, then there probably won't be any need. We could all just trade like, uh, you know, w trade with the rest of the world without needing to have this label. No, but um, everybody has some kind of union. Because even Asia, like he said, I found that there is an Asian, there's a, an economic grouping of Asian countries, mm -hmm. A-S-E-A-N, where they come together under an economic union of sorts mm. of Asian countries. So everybody's looking for well, yeah. common so everybody interest. Everybody needs an umbrella yeah. to Yeah, to so move. you can be stronger together. Mm. Do okay. I have time to respond? Yeah. Well, we'll, let, you them, we'll let you get them coming. <laughs> yeah, yeah but, but I think that um, if we're not doing well, then we're not doing well, and that's why we're killing Pan-Africanism. Um, and, and so it's not so much that it's a bad idea. It's that we can't do it. We're not doing it. If we had good health... Um, uh, if we had good health in all our countries, there's no reason why Madagascar should come up with something and then you just push it down. What did Mag what tests did Madagascar do that was well that are coming. that are known to be good and have always been working in the past? What has Nigeria done that works? When they were all shouting behind uh, what's that man's name, um, additional, I was just laughing. Okay. And that's why I wrote somewhere on Facebook that I don't work with Adesh. <laughs> I have never worked for him or with him. I don't know him. He's a stranger. Why would I get up and start saying Adesh must be left, you know, alone? If he has done something wrong and they didn't find him guilty at first, but somebody says, I'm going back again, like a court of appeal or a Supreme Court, you know, that kind of... But well, Adesh has process. a good track record. Why shouldn't he? Chuka, he no, has no, a good track no, record. No, 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 no. no I disagree they, with you. Been... You They've cannot say things. that because it's that's out there. a story you've been told. Mm. But that's what's no, out in the public domain. Yeah, Let him go and defend easier. himself five times if it is necessary. No, which, um, can it, if, he, if he goes five times before a legal panel that has a legal... That's the question. Is it legal? Uh, whatever, to, because it's unprecedented to go, to go and constitute an independent I, I, panel I think it, after you've had an in, I, in, internal... That's what I wrote. I said, I said if, it is, if it is legal, 
if they look for a legal way to try him, even after he has been tried within the bank, he should go and answer. Yeah, yeah, I'm There's with you no on that. no such thing as that. Now, what I'm saying is that we need systems that show that we're a very well-rounded continent. And then we can, we don't need to shout and jump up for our man when he may even be wrong. Mm. Rather, it will just work. There will be respect. We have no respect, and that's what you don't seem to understand. It's neither here nor there. I, I heard David very clearly mm. uh, on, on this subject matter. Africa, and I will use some of the other examples. COVID organic is an example. COVID organic is an African product. But the acceptability of COVID organic should not be because it's an African product. It should be because Africa has held its own feet to the fire and that product, we are proud of it and we know it will work. And we can take it as our own, own it. And that is what my own idea of Pan-Africanism should be. It's not about accepting inferior quality or not subjecting things to normal uh, procedures and say it is African. On, on, on the flip side, when you have a, a nation, I mean, a, a continent like Africa, where we don't trade with ourselves, but we trade with the boats, there's a problem somewhere there. And there must be people, leaders within Africa, who see these things and are championing it to say, look, we cannot leave ourselves alone and start trading with all the other people. Asians trade with themselves, Americans trade with themselves, and here we are, we prefer to trade with the outside without trading with ourselves. As they like to say, Africa is a country. On the previous edition titled, A Call to a New Order, Neville Agbonwanete says, if we really desire independence of the various arms of government and particularly the, the judiciary, the funding of the judiciary must be directly from the Federation account. It has to be constitutionally provided for. The executive arm should not even have anything to do with the funding of the judicial arm of government. There is a conflict of interest in our present arrangement where the, ex the executive arm allocates funding to the, to the judiciary. Where is the principle of separation of powers? We are operating a flawed structure in Nigeria and that is why we are where we are as a nation. The nation that remains stagnant and bogged down by corrupt practices at all levels. Whereas Victor Edieta says, Madam, what did you mean by planning for another 60 years? After some regions have been marginalized under the same 60 years and threatened, causing war, amongst, causing war against themselves, abuses, and bribing some leaders from the region to forsake their citizens. I believe it shouldn't stand as a notice, but a statement that Nigeria has failed woefully in, in its responsibilities because of corrupt, corrupt leaders. Victor and Ediete, thank you for your feedback but failure is a function of time and the capacity to solve a problem, neither of which has been exhausted. So we continue to advocate and welcome you joining your voice to ours on our social media platforms. On Facebook, we are Plus TV Africa and hashtag the Advocate NG. And on Twitter and Instagram, we are at Plus TV Africa and hashtag the Advocate NG. To catch up with previous broadcasts, go to plustvafrica.com slash the advocate. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Plus TV Africa. Now, after the break, Chuka is set up to really say something. Keep listening. The time has come not just to speak out, but to really hear what one another is saying. Without that, it's all a bunch of noise. So I'm really saying something. Mama, Mama. Those words will forever be remembered. George Floyd, trapped, unable to move, just needed to breathe. Air became the most expensive commodity for him. He knew he was dying. In desperation and now incoherent, he called out to his mother. Yes, a 46-year-old man. That's what happens when you are desperate and watching your own death, remembering someone who protects or protected you someone placed to look after you when you were helpless. George Floyd was calling out to God through his servant, his mother. Three weeks ago, none of us knew George Floyd, but on Tuesday, his funeral was beamed live on Sky News and other channels, like he was some statesman. But the race is not to the swift. A lot happens to some at a most unexpected late stage of life. Parallel to the Sky News live broadcast, British Home Secretary Priti Patel herself of Indian extraction, 
exhibited out of tune stance in referring to the protests in Bristol and Westminster as disgusting and sickening, failing to feel the pulse, which even her prime minister did. Perhaps because this has not been Indian lives matter or she suffers from slave mentality. For while violence is not the most appreciated act of complaint or defiance, it is serving a great purpose right now and all need to fall in line. Nothing has won my heart as the fall of the statue of Colston in Bristol. And on Tuesday, a revival of the roads must fall for the removal of the statue of the imperialist that stands within the University of Oxford. The black race is the most disregarded and disrespected on earth, voted most likely to fail. Many have been colonized, imprisoned, and enslaved, but none quite like the black race. All other races actually look down on black people. The anti-black problem in the United States can be linked to Africa. Africa of 500 years ago and Africa today. For Africa is the motherland. We should be protecting our diaspora sisters and brothers, maintaining a good home in Africa so that they are proud of us, so that they can leverage on our worth. So this subjugation of blacks by blacks in Nigeria and Africa and unofficial apartheid is underpinned by tribalism, a form of racism. It continues today. While some nations here try to rise above this petty thieving and sectionalism, the major thrust is still the same. And behind all this is a quest for power, power to write the evil narrative, power to steal from the commonwealth of the people, power against one's own people. The police, the skewed conspiratorial, conspiratorial judicial system are exactly where racists and sectionalists will want to be. So when you come to Africa and see police brutality of black on black, it is a quest for power which ultimately creates the enabling environment for apartheid and grand theft. The force, the police force that is, is now a natural home for many who carry evil bias, necessitating a change to change the criteria for enrollment, kick out the thugs and evil sectionalists in the USA and in Nigeria. But most importantly, in all life, we must make it tough for evil, for the evil few to continue to manipulate the many. Prepare to fight in Nigeria. Prepare to remove the fake heroes on our Naira notes, named on our streets and adorned with undeserved national and professional awards. Cut down public salaries and staff, embrace technology, and drop the inferiority complex held for other races. My late mother predicted that in my lifetime, we could see a, gen a new generation sack Ikui and the like violently. Let's see. Hmm. Uh, I know you could hear the, you could hear the tan tan tan. Yeah. <laughs> The I mean, uh, uh, what, what I like about what you said is, is the fact that you've been able to draw a correlation or look across from what's happening in America too. Because sometimes it's as if we're all focused on fighting, you know, racism, we're focused on, and we forget that actually <laughs> there's a common, uh, do you say, denominator in the sense that we are also brutal towards ourselves. So you have, you know, police are dealing with the people they call Yahoo boys just because, maybe they're envious of them, I don't know. And so you sort of say, it's, it's in humanity. It's in humanity to be bully those they feel threatened by or to bully those they feel are inferior to them. You still hear of white-on-white -white killing. So I think if, uh, the sooner we recognize that it's a human problem rather than a racist problem, not that the racism doesn't exist, but to also see that you could also be in that position where you abuse power, then uh, the more likely we are to really take, take it seriously and be on our guard against it. Well, I mean, I, I liked uh, what you could, well, would I, would you say you like it? But yeah, I mean, the point that you made that, um, you know, Africans are, or blacks are the most looked down upon as far as I, you know, the figures, the figures are out there. But um, you, the point that you made was that it was actually our fault, if I'm, if I'm exactly. understanding of it, okay. that yes, that is because we don't treat ourselves well we don't create a good environment back home, you know. And I, and I buy into that, I do agree with that, because I, I keep saying, you know, how can we expect to be taken seriously when we've left our country because we believe our country is rubbish, and then we go over to another country, and then we're now demanding what we don't even have 
in our own country. You know, no, but one of the black Americans who had no option, they were taking their, their parents with four Yes, okay, but let's, then let's take they it into a the smaller, double. yes, then let's even make it smaller. Also, black on black crime is mm. tremendously more than any of all these uh, figures that you can put together. So when we, blacks, blacks are killing blacks anyhow, you know, then you now want to say, oh, other races, is it, is it only considered brutality when white people kill black people. I like the point that Chuka made that uh, the state of Africa is directly, the current modern state of Africa is directly linked to the conditions that black people face globally. Mm -hmm. um, I wanted to point out that at a point in the 20th century, the kind of treatment that black people are accustomed to now was also extended to Italians, was extended That's to right, Irish people, thing. was extended to Koreans, and was extended to Japanese people. At a point, Japanese people in the US were all rounded up and put in the concentration camps during the Second and World the Jews War. Have just had their own fashion. before and during, exactly. What changed their situation was not that the US came and gave them civil rights, so that someone paid them reparations. Or, exactly. That's not what changed. What changed was that their home countries became successful. Mm -hmm. So they were able to leverage that. So if you tell a Japanese American, oh, go back home, it's not an insult. Mm -hmm. If you tell him, go back to Japan. Japan is a better country than the US. But you can't tell if an African American, go back to Africa, that's a slur. Why is it a slur? Because Africa is in a terrible state and they consider it to be an insult. Mm -hmm. So the state of Africa directly is linked to what black people go through worldwide. So mm -hmm. what we do to ourselves in Nigeria essentially is what leads to people like George Floyd getting killed. The decisions we make here have a direct impact on how our long lost... I still, I still beg to differ. I mean, well, I, 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 it's not that I don't see your link. Uh, let me just make the point briefly. It's just not that I don't see the link, but I still want to separate it. It's a bit like when people say, if you dress provocatively, you're entitled to be raped. I see that some people are drawn by that, but it doesn't mean somebody who is a rapist is a rapist. Someone who is a, a killer at Definitely. heart and will kill you because of Definitely. your skin yeah, color absolutely. or because he looks down on absolutely. you is an evil human being. I agree. Being. I agree. However, it matter what's happening. However, in however, in the world, don't have options, in the world of like, uh, in the world of geopolitics, you have to assume that everyone is a bully and everyone mm -hmm, is a killer. Exactly. So it, I, I, I remember I had a mentor who once said that on the on in this world you have to assume that you only have what you can defend. You have to assume that everybody is, is trying to take what you have. That's, the world is a very cold and cruel place mm -hmm. in geopolitical terms. It's a, it's a bit of an emotional thing for me. Um, I, I have been a victim of, of some um, discriminative dealings uh, while I lived for a short while in America. And it, it goes beyond the simple explanation of uh, uh, because we are not uh, doing what we're supposed to do and all of that. So it's, is a deeply historical issue and it has come along. But having said that, what cannot be taken away, uh, which I, I, I think is a part of the matter, is the fact that if Africa rises up today and we live up to the promises that this continent represents and we become respectable in the Committee of Nations, it will have an impact on how blacks are treated everywhere. I agree. Chuka, it's like I could feel your heart with that advocacy. We look to a time when we would identify with one another's needs and fight one another's battles. I'll be framing what that looks like with my advocacy after the break. Five panelists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. What, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. That's it, it, it does. It does. It does. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you. The road to a brighter future begins with our being courageous enough to get on it and simply get started. 
I'm going to be talking about the road to 2023 and beyond, the consensus of common interest. What can I can't breathe, Arab Springs, United Kingdom, United States, United Arab Emirates all have in common? I'll leave you to guess whilst I proceed with my advocacy. I imagine you, won't, you would have arrived at an answer before too long. Prosperity follows purpose, just as solutions and service are two sides of the same coin. Do I seem to be speaking in parables? Okay, let me speak more plainly then. Pursuing or hoarding money as an end in itself is shown in the endless vampire-like draining of our national resources by a batcher or which seems to be happening with the Niger Delta on Development Fund, amongst other institutional lootings. This is a preamble to death and decay. The actions of our leaders would seem to be of those who gluttonously feast on the goose that lays the golden egg, and later ask, what's for dessert? It's the height of foolishness. When we reflect on our failed democracy, it becomes apparent that the lack of common interest is at the heart of this failure. Common interest overcomes divisive tribalism, nepotism, elitism, racism, and other such like selfish interests. Ism may as well read, I serve myself first and last. Common interest is contrary to this. It ensures we come together for the common good. Building a better today and a better future for ourselves and the future of other generations. Colonel Umar, retired, accused our president of lopsided appointments, which he said was ru running or ruining this country. And I could hear the huge swell of silent acquiescence. But of course, in whose dictionary could lopsided appointments ever translate to common interest? We know what is right. Now is the time to put it into practice. Let us take personal responsibility for securing the interest of every Nigerian, regardless of tribe, religion or other groupings used by politicians to divide us. If we fail in this, then it is we who have failed, not just our politicians. For the leadership to get away with self first, there must first be many more selfish followers who would hold the door open for them, all the while prostrating with cries of, Organa Madame, I'm loyal. Consider the farmer who puts seed into the ground in hope. The seed germinates, even multiplies, and others besides him are nourished by its produce. That is the language of productivity in the common interest. Let us not believe the lie that Nigeria has gone to hell in a handbasket. If we sow today, we will reap a harvest that is hev a heavenly nation, one that is bound in freedom, peace, and unity. By now, you must have guessed what the various groupings have in common. Yes, you guessed right, common interest. Yeah, I mean, th this is it. We really should come together and have a common interest. But unfortunately, <laughs> it, is not, it is not the way it works. You know, um, we're so divided on so many different lines. And, um, you know, it, it's quite interesting that my topic was about labeling as well, because that, that's part of a, a way that we are divided. Um, I was reading some stuff and the way people generalize about different tribes, um, you know, so it's almost like they don't even see the individual. You know, they just hear, oh, you're Igbo or you're Yoruba, and then they ascribe all these characteristics and usually negative um, to you. So um, that way, people don't come together. They don't even allow themselves to even interface to a, a degree where they could even know the human in, you know, under or in, around this label or whatever you want to call it. So as much as I love what you're saying, I just feel like, I don't know, Nigeria right now, because they, we feel like the cake is so small, we're not, we don't believe that there's enough to go around. So what we need to do is as, take, our share. Yeah, take our share and try and get rid of those that may be trying to take some of that share. Wow. So, yeah, unfortunately, that is the mentality here. You know, I mean, the, at the speed and the, the ferociousness that our politicians jump into the race and, you know, considering we're being told that Nigeria is, you know, we don't have money anymore, nothing's going, but yet they're in there. It's like they're fighting for the little that is left. I think we can have a common interest if Nigerians were more historically aware. <laughs> I think yeah. the things that are used to divide Nigerians, which are primarily ethnicity and religion, mm. if Nigerians understood their history over even just the past 100 years, I think they would ascribe a lot less importance to these things. If if every, well, not every Nigerian, but if most Nigerians understood that, regardless of whether you are 
Ibibio or yeah, Yoruba, wherever you are from in this country, your experiences are actually not that different historically up till today. So 300 years ago, you know, regardless of where you were born in this country, there was a risk that at any point in time you could be kidnapped by slave raiders and you get sold and taken to the port in Badagri or without wherever and taken to Jamaica or the US. After that then came colonialism where everyone uniformly was humiliated mm. by the British. Uniformly. There was no, oh, you know, we, this group is above this group. The British humiliated everyone equally. We're all black people to them. But when you look closely, um, think about the fact that what Abdullahi wants or what Uche wants, or what Bolaon wants, or what Osage wants, when you really drill down, are not particularly different. Education, mm -hmm. healthcare, if I'm sick, I want to be able to get healed or, or, or attended to. Uh, I want to be able to pursue happiness, to get a job, to be able to, you know, have a family, whatever. And wherever you go to, you find those common denominations. Don't be deceived by anything called Boko Haram. Boko Haram is, is, um, is, is a creation of the northern elite in the sense that they send their own children to all the best schools in Nigeria and abroad. Mm -hmm. So, and they are also Muslim. So there's nothing like uh, uh, education is Haram. It's yes. nonsense. It's, it's, it doesn't exist. You know, so when you go to that ordinary citizen across the entire nation, what they want is the same. I mean, mm. I, what partly inspired this was, you know, I, I heard of some people coming together because of the COVID-19. They're looking for ways to do some good in the community. And, and, and I realized they went even diverse from different parts of Nigeria, but they've been so motivated by the people, the sufferings of other people in their community that they, they're coming together. Mm -hmm. And, and I thought, well, that's, that's, and even if you look at, you know, like where I work, we're, we're all working towards a common goal. And it's, it's amazing when your eye is fixed on a singular goal, you forget. You're just looking for who is the best person exactly. to support, to get the job done. Yeah, I think, it, it, you see, what it is is that how do we get us as Nigerians to not keep being um, sectional? Because that's really what, mm. you know, is behind all this. Um, you know, there was this message, uh, message I was answering today on WhatsApp about the lopsidedness or not of the NNPC, um, whatever. Mm. And they were writing and trying to show how they are probably more Southerners, actually, in NNPC, than Northerners. Okay. And I just thought, I mean, this is a load of cuts, water, really. Because the Minister of Petroleum is from the North, that's Buhari. The DG in the Ministry of Finance that was sent to be on the board will report back to the Finance Minister, who is Northern, and the MD himself of NNPC is Northern. That's, that's what we like all of us on this panel today, are far more educated to be bamboozled by the nonsense that your, your president is sectional. And how are you going to make progress if that happens? I think this is partly what makes people long for strong men, somebody who can hammer everyone into a single direction. Mm, yeah. However, I think in this case, what Nigerians actually need, or if so, some, what a smart politician would do if they were say the president, is that they will take advantage of that desire for a strong man. And instead of acting like a dictator, they would rather try to inspire yeah. Nigerians. That's okay. the ultimate yeah, form of being right, a yeah. politician. Yes, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah. We look forward to that. Mm. OK. Yeah. Although it seems like we're pointing out the things we should already know, it's in pointing it out that we're able to reach a consensus on the way forward. So keep the conversation going on our social media platforms on Facebook, Plus TV Africa, hashtag the advocate ng or on twitter and instagram at plus tv africa hashtag the advocate ng to catch up with previous broadcasts go to plus tv africa.com forward slash the advocate don't forget to subscribe to our youtube channel plus tv africa till next time when we'll be dropping more heartfelt advocacies no excuses just a stirring to action and solutions let's keep advocating for a better society bye bye Oh, is that it? <laughs> five panellists, five topical issues, no holds barred. For me, it's not knowledge that's lacking. It's that greed, it's that mentality where you feel you deserve to take your own and take it infinitely and let everybody else just manage however they will manage. We're almost becoming hardwired to try and cheat. I would, you know, suggest that we begin to hold our leaders accountable. There was a time in this country 
when yes. things actually work. I don't think that any organization should be above the law. And I think one of the challenges we have in this country is about governance across the board. Well, well, what I'm saying is that it doesn't really affect us in Nigeria. I don't know what we can do if the system is already corrupted. We've been warned as a continent of the influx of the Chinese. If you don't repay your debt, they will just colonize you.